Mr. Bonnie here this time with our next botany lesson on plant cells. So let's take a look at first and foremost some a little bit of biology review in that of the cell theory in that all living things are made of cells that basically that cells are the basic unit of life or the basic structural unit of all living things and that cells must come from other cells. These are just some of our basic principles that we refer to when we think of any type of cell not just plant cells. There's two general varieties of cells, the first being prokaryotic, which are much more simplistic. So things like bacteria are prokaryotic cells. They're smaller, less complex. They do not contain a nucleus or other organelles. And these are considered to be the very first types of cells, are these prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells, or the types of cells that plants are made of, as well as animals and protists and fungus, are larger, more complex because they contain organelles like a nucleus and so they can do more inside of the space that they're given because of those little compartments of those organelles. So all of the complex organisms that we think of are made of eukaryotic cells. In fact, all multicellular organisms are made of eukaryotic cells. There are no multicellular prokaryotic organisms. We compare the two. Again, we look at the, the presence or absence of a nucleus as being one of the defining features for eukaryotic cells and also then ha not having one for prokaryotic cells. Their chromosomes are, or their DNA are, is arranged differently. In eukaryotic cells, they tend to have chromosomes, so long strands of DNA, where in prokaryotic cells, they just have one circular piece of DNA most frequently, although they will sometimes have just a single piece, a long plasmid. Um, again, the number three is talking about the presence or absence of organelles. Eukaryotic cells have them, prokaryotic don't. Most often an individual cell in a multicellular organism for sure will reproduce itself by mitosis. This is number four. And then in prokaryotic cells, they reproduce by a process that's called binary fission. And then when they reproduce, this is when they divide, they're essentially making a new copy of themselves. And so it's all a asexual process to make clones. Eukaryotic organisms can use sexual reproduction and it's not known to happen in prokaryotic cells. Cells are tiny. They're really, really small, um, and they are microscopic for lack of a better way of describing them. And because they're so small, you can fit a lot of them into any given space. Recent estimations, and again, there's certainly estimations, put the number of cells inside of a human around 50 trillion cells. So you can imagine how many cells you would find, for example, inside of a redwood tree that's so, so much substantially larger. So cells are super, super tiny. Now, plant cells specifically have some unique features about them that you won't find in animal cells. For example, we talk about the strength of plant cells. Plant cells are incredibly strong and rigid. And where does that strength come from? It ultimately, it comes from their cell walls, something that we lack in our own animal cells. Now, cell walls are primarily composed of a carbohydrate called cellulose. Now, cellulose is a polysaccharide. That means it's made of many individual monosaccharides put together. So when a plant does photosynthesis and it makes glucose and it has extra glucose, it's going to save it. One of the ways it can save it and then use it is to build it into cellulose. Cellulose is often considered to be the most abundant uh, organic chemical compound on the planet, more than any other organic chemical compound. It's not more or abundant than, say, water, for example, but in, in living things, cellulose is the most common. Cellulose is also really difficult for you to digest in your digestive system, which is why you have bacteria that live in your digestive system that help you to digest it. But it is the main component that makes up plant cell walls, and it's what gives it all of its strength. There is a degree of elasticity to it, and you've noticed this if you've noticed like the, the a leaf, right, for example, can bend to a degree. A trees will sway in the wind. It's not like a so rigid that as soon as it starts to bend, it will break. So there is some give to this cellulose in the plant cell walls. And we take a look at um, the types of cell walls. Every plant cell has what's called a primary cell wall. And that's the, in these four cells that are listed down here, that's what this black bar is on the outside. That's the primary cell wall. You notice the yellow space in between it, it has a special name too. It's called the middle lamella. Now that's filled primarily with water and then a substance that's called pectin, which is kind of a thick gelatinous uh, polysaccharide. So it's a type of carbohydrate as well. Oftentimes pectin is used in cooking as a thickening agent itself, but there is a small space, albeit microscopic, in between each of these cells. And we call that space the middle lamella. Now, some plant cells have an additional cell wall that we call the secondary cell wall. So notice this grayed area inside of the primary cell wall, and it is off, always found inside of the primary cell wall. So every cell has a primary cell wall. Some have a secondary cell wall. And the secondary cell wall provides some extra functionality. 
One of the things it can have inside of it is something called lignin, which is a hardening agent. So you'll find lignin in the cells that make up that of wood or in the shells of nuts. Another thing that can be added into these secondary cell walls are subarin and cutin, and these are waterproofing agents. So you'll find these on the bark of trees or on the tops of leaves to prevent water from building up on the top of the leaves so that the water can run out, run off the leaves so that it can continue to do photosynthesis. And again, when we take a look at the cell wall, depending upon the type of cell wall, it can take anywhere from 5 up to 95% of the cell's total volume just in that of the cell wall. Here's some images that show plant cells next to each other, and you can see the primary and then secondary cell walls um, with the secondary cell walls inside of them. And then the spaces between it being the middle lamella. This one right here shows it really well. Here's the middle lamella. Here's a primary cell wall, a secondary cell wall, and here's the inside of the cell. By the way, anytime you see lumen, that means inside of. So the cell lumen is the interior of the cell. Now, plant cells can be connected together by structures that are called plasmodesmata. These are like little tunnels or little bridges that connect adjacent plant cells. You can see them here in this drawing. These would be plasmodesmata connecting one plant cell to a next. And in this actual microscopic image, it almost looks like you're looking at an overhead of a city. And these are bridges with this being a river. So right here, the river then is our space in between the cells. The cell walls run right up next to them, but this would be the middle lamella. And then this is a plasmodesmata here and here and here. This is useful for plant cells to be able to send materials back and forth, like water or the products of photosynthesis, things like that. It allows for a form of communication between adjacent plant cells. All right, the other major thing that we find in plant cells that we don't find in any other types of living thing are plastids. And there's three major types of plastids. The first are called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are, of course, famous for their green color and for the fact that they do photosynthesis. So you can see a couple images here of cells with all of their chloroplasts. In this case, they look like they're kind of stacked on the outside. That's because they're being pushed there by a structure that's called a vacuole. More on those in a minute. But the main things that chloroplasts do is photosynthesis. They trap sunlight. They convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. This is what provides the plants with their food. And again, these chloroplasts, photosynthesis, photosynthesis, photosynthesis. Here's an image up top of a, or at least a drawing of a photosynthesis with a slice taken out of it so you can see the structure on the inside of it. And we'll cover this in more detail later, but it looks almost like it has like stacks of green pancakes, for lack of a better way of describing it, on the inside of these chloroplasts. And those have names. Each individual stack or each individual disc is called a thylakoid, and a whole stack of them together is called a granum. And then all of the st stacks is called grana for plural. So again, this is actually and taken with uh, an electron microscope, looking at just one individual chloroplast, and you can see the stacks inside of them there, of the thylakoids inside of the chloroplast. The second type of plast that we talk about are called leucoplasts, and these are used for storage. Now, they can primarily be used for storages of um, carbohydrates and oils. A one that stores starch is called an amylioplast because the chemical name of starch is amylose. And an elioplast would be a type of plastid that would store fats. It's very common for you to see these leucoplasts specifically in like potato cells. So here you have um, some potato cells, which is a root structure, or at least the, the root structures of from the, from the potato plant. And then some iodine has been added to these so you can see all of the starch storage, kind of turn that dark purplish, almost black color. That's, a, again, a great place for these plants to store excess starch. The final type of plastid are called chromoplast, and these are just here to provide color, to make that part of the plant attractive. So you'll find these in flowers and fruits, and flowers to attract in a pollinator, and then in fruits to attract in something to eat it so that that organism can eat the fruit along with the seeds and then transport the seeds to a new location to where they can be deposited elsewhere. Another interesting thing about plastids is they have the ability to change from one type to another. Think about tomatoes as they grow. They always start off green and then they ripen and turn red. Now when that color change happens, what's actually happening is the chloroplasts that are inside of the tomato are actually changing into chromoplasts. This happens for a few reasons. It tells organisms that, okay, yes, now is a good time to eat it. The color change indicates it. The sugar content inside of the tomato actually changes as well to make them taste better. And this is happening when the plant is finally ready for its seeds. Its seeds are finally developed and now it's saying to the animals, okay, come, now, come and eat these fruits now. Now we're ready for our seeds to be developed. 
Another type of transfer that you can see take place are leucoplasts turning into chlor uh, chloroplasts. And you can see this in potatoes. If you've left a potato out on the counter for too long, it'll start to develop and grow buds off of it. But what can also happen is those potatoes can start to green. And that's the process of converting leucoplasts, which stores starch, over into chloroplasts. By the way, you should never eat uh, green potatoes. As they start to go through that process of converting the leucoplasts over, it can also produce some toxins as a byproduct. So you do not want to eat green potatoes. All right, next we have vacuoles. Now, there's lots of cells that have vacuoles, but plant vacuoles are really unique in the fact that they can get very large. And that's because plants don't move around. Think about it. Plants use water just as much as we do, if not even more, because they do photosynthesis. And photosynthesis requires water in order for it to work. So they need to have an ample store of water at all times. And in fact, if you've ever noticed a leaf that looks like it's wilty, the reason why it's wilty is because it's lost so much volume inside of its vacuole that it looks like that cell itself is actually shriveled up. To increase the size of those cells again, what we need to do is we need to put water back into it. This idea of cell water pressure is called turgor pressure. And the inside of all of the vacuole contents have a fun name. They're called the cell sap. And some varieties of plant cells, the, the vacuole itself can take upwards of 95% of the total volume of that plant. And so in closing here, we've got, a, again, a microscopic image of some plant cells next to each other with all of their organelles taking place here. You can see in this one, you can see the nucleus and you can see a large vacuole separated by their cell walls and their connection points of the plasma desmata. So some really unique features that we find only in plant cells is their cell walls with cellulose and then the plastids and large vacuoles. And that's it on plant cells. Next, we'll take a look at, a closer look at photosynthesis.